right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started here. Welcome to another Moran Ice Center Grand Arounds. I'll be moderating today. Today, we have a lot of great discussions and topics from our medical students and also oculoplastics. First up will be Amy Amoy. She's a rising second year medical student from the University of South Florida, talking about um, improving compliance to follow up eye care for children. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So as previously mentioned, my name is Amy Amoa and I'm a rising second year uh, medical student from USF Morsani College of Medicine. Today, I'll be providing background information and an introduction to a research project that I started during my time here at the Moran in collaboration with Dr. Asari, who's my research mentor. The aim of our project is to ultimately identify summarize and disseminate strategies to improve follow-up eye care for children after failed vision screenings in primary care settings. So we're gonna start off with a case presentation. Our patient is a 13 month old girl who presents to the ophthalmology clinic at Riverton for a follow-up evaluation after a failed vision screen with her primary care provider. She failed her vision screen due to anisometropia. Upon further examination, she was found to have myelinated retinal nerve fibers in her right eye. She also had high myopia in her left eye and was a refractive amblyopia suspect. Her mom was counseled to have her wear glasses full time. In subsequent visits, patching of the right eye was recommended for an isometropic amblyopia of her left eye. Cases like these underscore the importance of vision screening and follow-up eye examination early in life as they are crucial for preventing avoidable vision loss in children. So vision screenings and follow-up eye examinations enable early detection and prevention of vision loss from a myriad of conditions like amblyopia. Amblyopia is a leading cause of preventable and reversible vision loss in children and the prevalence among US children under three is about two to 3%. There's also a narrow window of opportunity to detect and treat amblyopia as well as its risk factors. And after about the age of eight, the effectiveness of amblyopia treatment declines and visual loss can become irreversible. As a result, the US Preventive Services Tax Force recommends vision screening at least once in all children aged three to five years old. Other associations like the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus recommends vision screenings to start at birth. So vision screenings can be performed by primary care providers as well as trained laypersons at schools and as well as community-based screening programs. Vision screenings function as quick tests to flag potential eye conditions that a child may have. In primary care settings, visual acuity test and instrument-based screening, either using a photo screener or an auto refractor are the primary methods of assessing vision in children. When a child does not pass a component of the vision screen, timely referral for a comprehensive exam in order to enable diagnosis and treatment of vision problems are crucial. Despite the importance and benefits of vision screening, the literature shows that children are not getting the necessary eye care due to poor follow-up compliance. For example, authors of the following study from the Journal of American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus surveyed the, parent, the parents of children who failed a vision screen in order to determine the rate of follow-up and identify barriers to follow-up exams. Of the 57 surveyed parents, 29% of them were not aware of their child screening failure. Of the 40 parents who were aware of their child screening failure, 17% of them did not schedule a follow-up appointment and 5% of them missed their child's follow-up appointment. So this study found that parental unawareness of their child screening failure due to possible miscommunication, in addition to parental unawareness of the need for follow-up, and logistical challenges like forgetfulness and scheduling conflicts were the main causes of poor follow-up compliance. 
for the sake of time, I will skip over this study, but again, it uh, shows different barriers to follow-up compliance. So as noted, reasons for poor follow-up include a combination of provider, system, and patient factors. Several studies have reported on interventions to improve follow-up compliance after failed vision screenings, but these studies have primarily focused on schools and community-based screening programs. An example of such interventions involve providing assistance in scheduling a follow-up appointment at, with an eye specialist after a failed vision screening. In an initial review of the literature, we found that not as many studies investigated improving follow-up from primary care providers to eye care providers. So the aim of our scoping review is to summarize existing strategies to improve follow-up compliance for children after abnormal vision screenings in primary care settings, as well as identifying gaps in the literature. So a scoping review is a preliminary assessment of the potential size and scope of the available research literature. They allow us to investigate broad research questions, examine the extent and nature of research activity, summarize research findings, and identify gaps in the existing literature. For our scoping review, we plan to include articles that have children from three to five years of age and its target population, we also plan to include articles that are peer reviewed, that are published in peer reviewed journals, and that report strategies to improve compliance to follow up eye care from primary care providers to eye care providers. We will exclude articles that are reviews, case reports, or opinion pieces, and articles not written in English. We will also exclude articles that do not have strategies to overcome barriers to follow up. So this is our initial search strategy. It's broken down into four main concepts or keywords. And uh, this search strategy took a couple weeks to develop and required um, looking up relevant medical subject headings as well as synonyms for our four main concepts. After running this search strategy through PubMed, we got um, 149 hits or potentially relevant articles to our topic of interest. So in terms of the next steps, we are currently in the process of writing a protocol for our scoping review and plan to have that registered. We've also had a research librarian analyze our search strategy and she's helping the, us refine that as well. Once our search strategy is finalized, we plan to run it through the relevant databases such as Medline, Embase, CINAHL, PsycInfo, Web of Science, and Scopus. And then we'll screen the articles Screening will be done um, in two teams. Each team will have a medical student as well as a faculty member with expertise in um, our topic. And then it will be done in two levels. So the first level will be a review of the, the titles and abstracts. And then the second level of review would be a full-on review of the evidence. So I plan to continue um, working on this research project remotely, even after my time ends at the Moran. Okay, so these are my references. And I would first like to thank Dr. Asare for her guidance and support during my time here at the Moran and allowing me to join her on uh, this research project. I would also like to thank Dr. Vagunta for her support and helping me uh, to refine my presentation. I would also like to thank all the physicians that allowed me shadow them and the residents that I worked with that um, just made me feel welcome during my time here. And finally, I would like to thank the Moran for giving me the opportunity to learn and gain exposure to the field of ophthalmology. So this concludes my presentation and I'm open to any questions. Great job and thank you for the great presentation. Any questions right now? Right, go ahead. It's not um, a great question. Um, the you know the amblyopia is so dependent on which what what the cause is. You know, deprivational amblyopia is so sensitive. Refractive. I've had patients who are in their teens who had never been treated and gained several lines 
uh, after being in the proper correction and, and with patching. So the, there's been some studies that have shown that if it's if you don't have a history of patching, that um, actually the, the eyes are pretty responsive to glasses and patching late, even later in life. But I, I think to, given the degree of anisometropia and the depth of the amblyopia, it um, has a pretty wide range. Uh, what's interesting is that we're seeing tons of kids coming in now with the, these auto refractors uh, is, as like eight months old or eight, eight month olds or uh, even up to two and three, there's a big influx. And so we're, we're catching more early, which has been good, but sometimes it's, uh, you know, there's probably a little oversensitivity in that, in that screening, but that was a great presentation, Amy. And I think it's pretty impressive too, the number of people who aren't coming in. I mean, that, that for, for the last study, and I think looking at those barriers is going to be a really big deal, but hope I hope I answered your question, Bob. And I think again, Amy, Um, in a clinical setting, we see unilateral ptosis, they're amblyopic, and then a frontalis sling doesn't work well unless you're recruiting the frontalis. So the question in my mind is, at what point in time would you be able to regain or say to, to develop single binocular vision? Uh, I don't think it, I mean, it, that's a more early life sort of yeah. window, isn't it? The binocularity is really sensitive. So if that, if it's, I mean, especially with something like severe ptosis that's causing, um, you know, amblyopia, if, if, they're, if they're not fusing with both eyes in that first year, sometimes even the first six months, um, you know, for the patients who have like congenital strabismus, that seems to be the most, one of the most sensitive short windows. Um, I, I, I find a lot of those patients with ptosis, I'm amazed how many of them compensate with just a giant chin up head position and, and seem to, to still maintain it because that drive for binocularity, if it's an option at all, is powerful. I mean, kids will touch their ear to their to their uh, shoulder just to get their fourth nerve palsy diffused. They're pretty. They're pretty good at. Um, yeah. Um, no. When we see chin up head position, that's great news. We know. Right. We know that that'll work then. Right. But, okay. Thank you. Thank you both for the great discussion. Next up, we'll have Junay Ascardas, a fourth year medical student from Florida State University, presenting from holy terror to ideal recovery. Please welcome. Thank you. Ethan, can I do a presenter view from here? Alrighty, thank you everyone. So uh, my name is Janae Dos Cardas. I'm a fourth year medical student at Florida State University. And uh, this talk is titled From Holy Terror to Ideal Recovery. Um, so when we had orientation, Dr. Jardine said that he would rather be bored to death for eight minutes than to have his mind blown in 15. So our objective today is actually just to blow your mind in eight minutes alone. Um, so we're going to start with, uh, well, financial disclosures and under report. So we'll start with a case presentation. So we have a 71-year-old pseudophagic woman with a history of type 2 diabetes presenting, uh, complaining of decreased vision in her left eye for six months. On ocular exam, she had the best corrected vision of 2100 in that eye in 2020 in fell, or, uh, her fellow eye. Slit lamp exam, uh, her anterior segment was unremarkable. And then fundus exam revealed a chronic stage four full thickness macular hole in the left eye and it was confirmed by OCT and showed a diameter of 519 micrometers. And you can see the wise ring on the left-hand side over there. And so treatment plan for this patient was a PPV with ILM PO 12% C3F8 gas tamponade and face down positioning. 
which she did for uh, two weeks and then followed up. Hole was still open. And so we had her face down for two more additional weeks and again, still open. So this is an OCT four weeks post-op reveals that the hole still open has a diameter of 307 micrometers at this point. And despite discussing reoperation, which is kind of the go-to strategy for cases like this, she declined and didn't want to go through another operation. Um, so she was just instructed to follow up with routine surveillance appointments. And again, this is just six weeks post-op showing a hole still open. And then two months post-op, she presented urgently to clinic with acute pain, conjunctival injection, and photophobia in the left eye. Slit lamp exam showed one plus cellular reaction in the anterior chamber and the OCT revealed CME. And as you can see, the hole is actually closed up now. And so due to timing, she was diagnosed with idiopathic post-op iritis with macular edema and she was treated uh, just to get rid of some of that swelling with triamcin alone, a 40 milligram injection. And this was one month after that injection. So you can see that the hole's closed up now and there's a little central cavity um, in the outer retinal cavitation. And again, reiterating, this is four months after that triamcinolone injection. And she, when she returned and her final vision here was 2080. Um, but again, you can see the holes closed up now. Um, so how did I acquire this case? This was actually presented to me or uh, referred to me from Dr. Riley Sanders, who's a vitreoretinal surgeon at the University of Arkansas Medical Center. And he reached out in February of 2023. And we submitted this, for case, this case for publication this past month. And while I'm not the world's leading expert on macular holes, I do dabble in them. And so this was kind of the harbinger for why he reached out to myself and Dr. Brooks. This is a paper that we published in June, 2022. And so I just like to give a little overview on this case itself. Um, so this was a 70 year old pseudophagic woman who presented with an 18 month history of a central scotoma and reduced vision to 2200. Imaging revealed a stage three chronic macular hole shown in that first image with a diameter of 506 micrometers. And so treatment for her was PPV with ILM peel, 30% SF6 gas, and she did excellent face down positioning for two weeks. However, when she came back for her two week post-op appointment, uh, you can see that the surgery failed, the hole was still open, and the diameter was 337 micrometers at this point. She didn't have any edema here, but she, again, this was another patient who didn't wanna go back to the operating room, she'd already been having these visual changes for a year and a half now. So for her, she felt like it wasn't worth going back to another surgery. And so at this point, um, my research mentor, Dr. Brooks, who's the co-author on this paper with me, had this idea that, you know, maybe if we can induce edema that could bring the edges of this hole together and possibly lead to some sort of coaptation. So after informed consent, we decided to put her on latanoprost twice daily for six weeks. And when she followed back up, the third image shows that that was able to induce CME. And so at that point, she had a C3F8 injection into the vitreous cavity and was instructed to face down for five days. And when she followed up two weeks later, that was uh, her OCT in that final figure, that's figure four. And it shows that the hole had closed and her visual acuity eight months later was 20 over 50. So um, pathogenesis of idiopathic holes are not fully understood and there's multiple theories, but one of the most common factors in all the different theories is the involvement of vitreoretinal interface forces. And recently there's been some discussion about medical management for full thickness holes associated with CME, especially for smaller holes. And the treatments here usually include anti-inflammatories like NSAID drops with or without carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And those have been proposed as potential treatments for smaller holes with CME. Um, and it's believed that these treatments can dehydrate the hole if there's CME present, and that'll allow for closure. But kind of what we've been proposing in these two cases is that the reverse process of in increasing edemia via latanoprost, or in the first case that I presented by some sort of idiopathic iritis, has been shown to aid in closure of a large chronic hole that's failed primary surgery. And so this is kind of a nice figure that demonstrates how that happens. So you got a hole leaking and you just want to induce some edema. Um, I think this is a really good schematic to kind of go through with this idea presents. So uh, the top picture, this is from a paper in 2004 by Dr. Smitty and Flynn, and they talk about the pathogenesis of holes. The top figure, you can see that's the early stages of a macular hole and there's glial cell proliferation, which is that layer of cells that are a little more oblong and they extend to form a bridge and that can actually aid in a self-closure so by extending the edges of the hole, 
you can inhibit the further formation and create a seal to actually repair it. However, if posterior hyaloid detaches, then you lose that glial bridge and you've kind of got this hole and eventually it can progress to that bottom picture. Um, as the glial cells contract, you can see that the hole actually kind of gets that characteristic appearance where the edges have blunted and the slope has increased at the bottom portion. And so the, the theory that these two cases show is kind of, if we can go back from this chronic hole closure back to the original state, that can maybe aid in the formation. So um, really by inducing edema, you can bring the edges of the hole back closer together and then re-allow for this glial bridge formation to form. Um, so while this report, the original report had idiopathic post-op CME, uh, both cases that I've described demonstrated a potential effect of CME for larger holes persisting, especially after surgery. Uh, in both cases, the rehydration increased the volume of the edges of the retina hole or the macular hole and helped approximate the edges of the hole for coaptation. That process brings the glial cells closer together and it decreases the degree of obstacles for cell migration and bridge formation. <clears throat> And subsequent treatment, as in the first case with the triamcinolone afterwards, helps to dehydrate the CME, allowing for kind of a final resolution. And, you know, other holes for other methods for macular hole surgery, rescue are more invasive compared to this theory that we've uh, reported here. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the following people. Here are my references. And if this video will play, this will kind of go back to our objective. Oh, uh, you're crazy. Am I? Or am I so sane that you just blew your mind? <laughs> so thank you, and I'll take any questions. Yes, sir. Dr. Jardine, sorry. <laughs> My question to you is, um, what, remind me again what the visual acuity change was pre and post whole closure and then do you have any comment on their subjective description of their vision change if it improved if there's a survey done on that uh so in the first case i believe she presented 2080 and her or 2100 and her final vision was 2080 and that one was not as exciting just because she'd already failed surgery we weren't expecting to have a much better vision and she didn't even care for future surgery and that was the idiopathic cause where she had the iritis that closed it. And then in the second case, she presented with 2200. And then after surgery, which had failed, she presented with 2400. But then after inducing with latanoprost, her final vision was 2080 or 2050, I believe. So it had increased. And then, sorry, what was the second part? I'm not sure. Don't care about that. <laughs> yes, so, sir. how often do you know does latanoprost cause CME? Is that so frequent, it, or are you just really, really lucky? Um, from what I've read, it's kind of similar to the gas Irvine syndrome, so it's still up for debate a little bit. Um, there's been some cases that show that it does cause it, and others that show that it does not, but usually it's going to be after an inflammatory stage. So either post cataract surgery, um, in the second case, like a post, um, or sorry, in the first case, like a post iritis. Um, so I think from clinical experience and some of the studies that had been read by my research mentor with that latanoprost induced case, his theory was that it, it, for, for his patients, it normally does induce it. And whether it's the actual latanoprost or the preservatives, like the benzoyl chloride in the latanoprost what's causing the edema. I think that's still kind of- So, so would the, one consider that as a therapeutic trial in somebody with macular hole? That's, that was kind of the situation in that uh, original case that I presented um, that was published. That was the first time that that had been reported. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you all. Great job. Next up, we have Christopher Lee from University of Colorado School of Medicine presenting a rare masquerader. Thank you. 
All righty. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris, like uh, Chris Lee, like Brandon said. Uh, I'm a visiting fourth year medical student from the University of Colorado, and I'm going to present a case this morning. Special thanks to Drs. Hansen, Fuller, and Kohler for helping me to put this together. I have no disclosures. Talking a little bit about our patient, we had a 14-year-old uh, male with no significant past medical history who presented to the ED with three days of this blurred vision uh, from his left eye, a red eye, eye pain, fever, body aches, uh, and a facial rash. Uh, he described his vision as being blurry and dark and uh, reported being able to see objects that were uh, close to him and in the bottom of his field of vision. On examination of this patient, uh, he was noted to have a visual acuity of light perception only from that left eye and was positive for an APD. He had three plus conjunctival injection and pretty significant uh, anterior chamber and vitreous cell. Um, on fundus exam, his disc was hyperemic. The macula was detached with yellow intraretinal and subretinal exudative material. And on peripheral exam, uh, he was found to have a multifocal exudative retinal detachment with uh, a yellow whitish uh, appearance of subretinal exudative material, as well as retinal whitening and uh, hemorrhages peripherally. In terms of a differential diagnosis for this patient uh, presenting with this pan picture with an exudative retinal detachment, some of the things that we thought about um, were uh, seated in an infectious and non-infectious category, such as syphilis, bacterial endophthalmitis, uh, varicella panduveitis, sarcoidosis, and BKH. Other things to consider are vascular causes such as Coats disease um, and neoplastic causes such as lymphoproliferative disorders and retinoblastoma. This patient had a pretty extensive uh, workup um, on presentation. In the emergency department, he underwent a tap and injection, uh, which yielded a dry vitreous tap, but, uh, a successful AC tap. Uh, he also had a respiratory viral panel, a broad uveitis workup, and was also seen by the uveitis team here who recommended that uh, he get a, a vitreous biopsy done. So with that being said, the patient underwent an exam under anesthesia um, and also a vitrectomy with a vitreous biopsy, um, as well as intravitreal injection of several antimicrobial agents. In terms of the results for this broad workup, uh, most of it was uh, negative. Uh, of note, he was positive for uh, rhinovirus on PCR, and the vitreous culture came back growing a pan-sensitive staph capitis. And uh, importantly, this patient had a negative uh, carious panel. So given the result of this uh, negative carious panel, uh, it was thought that the vitreous culture coming back growing staph capitis was likely a contaminant. And so after uh, this patient's initial vitrectomy, uh, they were able to get an exam. And uh, this fundus photo on the left side of the screen here was taken after that vitrectomy. And it shows phalangiectatic vessels um, with bulbs and uh, associated yellow white subretinal exudates, um, as well as a multifocal exudative retinal detachment. Also, he had a wide field FA or fluorescein angiography done in the clinic uh, after this initial vitrectomy, showing, again, diffuse telangiectatic vessels uh, with these terminal light bulb aneurysms, capillary non-perfusion, and showing paravascular leakage as well. And so given these findings, uh, this patient was diagnosed with Coats disease stage 3A. So Coast disease uh, masquerading as a uveitis is a, is a rare but uh, reported entity in the literature. Uh, our patient here had a very unusual presentation given this adamant uh, sudden change in his vision um, and a history of a dilated exam a year prior that was reportedly normal. He also had these strange prodromal symptoms of uh, fever, chills. He also had a lesion near his lip resembling a cold sore. Um, this in association with uh, an exam concerning for a pan uveitis, um, kind of make this a, a strange presentation uh, with this disease uh, masquerading as a uveitis. Um, in this case, the, the key was obtaining the wide field fluorescein angiography following the patient's vitrectomy uh, in order to um, 
basically uh, see the pathognomonic findings uh, and characteristic findings in post disease. So uveitis masquerade syndromes are ocular and systemic pathologies that um, present with intraocular inflammatory cells uh, and an inflammatory picture, but aren't secondary to immune mediated or infectious processes. Uh, some of the things that we think about in uh, this category of diseases are classically intraocular lymphomas and uh, other non-malignant causes such as Coats disease and retinitis pigmentosa. So Coates' disease was first described by George Coates in 1908. Uh, it's a congenital, non-hereditary, idiopathic uh, disorder of the retinal vasculature that leads to this intraretinal and subretinal exudation. Uh, it's typically diagnosed in the first or second decades of life in males and is a unilateral disease affecting one eye in a patient. To briefly go over the pathophysiology and clinical features of Coates' disease, um, it's essentially a defect in the endothelial cells and abnormal parasites of the retinal vasculature uh, that leads to the development of these telangiectatic vessels, retinal ischemia, uh, and the leakage of this lipid-rich exudative material. Um, symptoms at presentation can be variable, um, but the ones commonly reported are vision loss, strabismus, and leukocoria. Uh, I want to highlight the key exam findings uh, that should be looked for in patients uh, with concern for Coates disease. Uh, and this includes the telangiectatic retinal vessels with capillary non-perfusion, uh, as well as this diffuse exudation that has a yellow-white appearance. The treatment of Coates disease, uh, the mainstay of treatment is laser photocoagulation, um, with the goal of treatment being to address the abnormal vasculature and to control uh, this exudative process. Recent literature has suggested uh, that anti-VEGF and uh, intravitreal steroid injections can serve uh, as an adjuvant therapy and help to control the exudation and macular edema. It's also worth noting that uh, a lot of these patients develop exudative retinal detachments and may necessitate vitreal retinal surgery, such as vitrectomy um, and external drainage of that exudative material. So a month after initial presentation, uh, our patient presented with a, uh, for, for treatment with laser, um, but on exam was found to have diffuse uh, vitreous hemorrhage and a now total uh, retinal detachment. Um, and so because of this, the patient was taken for a vitrectomy and scleral buckle uh, with external drainage and uh, adjuvant therapy with a Avastin intravitreal injection. Um, the picture at the top of the screen here uh, was taken shortly after that uh, vitrectomy. And now, after several months of uh, treatment with multiple uh, exams under anesthesia, laser treatments, uh, and Avastin or subtenons uh, canalog injections, uh, the photo on the bottom of the screen here highlights uh, an improvement of the patient's exudative retinal detachment, but its persistence, as well as improvement, but persistence of the uh, diffuse exudative material. Um, and also with some residual fibrosis interaction uh, involving the ret retina, uh, the macula, excuse me. Um, this patient's visual acuity recovered to count fingers uh, and uh, he's developed no signs of glaucoma. Thank you all for having me. It's been a great time um, getting to know the team here at the Moran and uh, look forward to the rest of my rotation. I can take any questions now. Any questions for, for Chris? Good job, Chris. All right, more. Yeah, I remember when this case came in. It's a super, super interesting case. Good job. All right, a little bit more uveitis here for our, our last medical student uh, discussion. So please welcome Krishna Malim um, from Drexel University discussing a geodemographic analysis of travel time to UVA specialists in the United States. All right. Uh Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Krishna Malam. I'm a fourth year medical student from the Drexel University College of Medicine. 
And today I'll be talking to you about an original research project, the title of which is a geodemographic analysis of travel time to UVI to specialists in the United States. I have no financial disclosures. So travel time to a patient's medical provider represents a significant component of access to care. There is a growing body of evidence in medicine that shows that increased travel times are associated with poor compliance and adverse outcomes for patients. I'd like to go through some of the studies that have been done to demonstrate this. So Kelly et al, they performed a systematic review of 108 papers in primary and secondary care specialties that suggested that increased travel times lead to poorer outcomes across a variety of specialties. The Dialysis Outcomes and Practice Pattern Study, or DOPS, showed that greater travel times for patients requiring dialysis resulted in increased mortality with reduced health-related health quality of life. Single center studies in bariatric and vascular surgery have showed that greater travel times are associated with poor post-op compliance and in fact served as independent predictors of decreased long-term survival. And multiple studies in oncology have shown that increased travel times are associated with higher cancer stage at the time of diagnosis, as well as potentially increased cost and reduced access to care. So what about in ophthalmology? There are a small number of studies that have looked at the role of travel time within ophthalmology. Uh, examination of the role of travel time in, in ophthalmology has been limited to general ophthalmology and glaucoma. Lee et al. performed a study in which they looked at the average driving distance or travel time for the American population to their nearest eye specialist, which they defined as an ophthalmologist or optometrist, and found that 90% of the American population lives within a 25.2 minute drive of their nearest eye specialist. Rothman et al. performed a similar study looking at Florida's elderly population and their travel time to the nearest glaucoma specialist, and they found that 88.4 of Florida's elderly population lived within a 60 minute driving distance of their nearest glaucoma specialist. However, a similar study had not previously been performed in uveitis, which is a relatively small subspecialty in ophthalmology and has a smaller number of fellowship trained doctors who are uh, trained to treat it. So in this study, we examined the travel time to the nearest uveitis specialist for the American population and characterized its potential impact on access to uveitis care. So addresses of fellowship trained uveitis specialists were collected from the American Uveitis Society and Ocular Immunology and Uveitis Foundation websites. And using ArcGIS 2.9 Pro, these addresses were geocoded and a map was constructed with all of the locations in the map for the United States. We then constructed 60 minute drive time service areas around each of these specialist location using uh, ArcGIS's cloud-based software. And to standardize, we set the parameters as the average driving distance on a weekday at midday uh, to simulate patient conditions. We then imported demographic data into our map using the American Community Survey and American Census Bureau. So variables that we imported included racial groups, household poverty levels, population in dependent groups, which was people who are younger than 18 or older than 65 for the American Community Survey and health insurance status, which were all overlaid at the census tract level. And then this data was aggregated for census tracts that fell within and outside of service area coverage, creating two groups. And these groups were compared across these variables using chi-square analysis. This table summarizes our results. Um, so on the left hand, we have the variables that we looked at. The left-sided column is for uh, populations that fell within service area coverage, so within that 60-minute drive time. And on the right-hand side, we have the population that falls outside of service area coverage. So we found that just about 63.3% of the American population lives within an hour driving distance from their nearest uveitis specialist. Uh, people within service coverage were 12%. Uh, there were 12% of them in households with a total income below poverty level versus 15% outside of service area coverage. Only 8% were uninsured within coverage versus 9.5% outside of service coverage. Uh, only 37.4% of people within coverage belong to a dependent age group versus 40.4% outside of service area coverage. And we looked at every ethnic group in the Census Bureau, but the major ones that we looked at in our analysis were uh, white non-Hispanic, which was 55.9% within service area coverage versus 66% outside. Uh, black or African-American, which was 14.7 versus 10% outside. And Hispanic, which was 19% within, but 16.6% outside of service area coverage. 
and all variables that we compared were found to be statistically significant. Um, this is the map that we constructed with all of the uveitis specialists and their uh, service areas. So in red, we have uveitis specialist locations, and the green clouds represent the 60-minute drive time service areas around each of their locations. Um, so immediately what you can see is up here in the Northeast, we have a relative saturation of UVI specialists, especially in large cities and at large tertiary care centers. So we're looking at New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Um, but as you move out further West, we can see that become relatively less dense. And once we get to the Midwest, all of a sudden it's like there's no one. So we come here, that's us right now. Um, so at the Moran, we have now, I believe, four UVI specialists. So doctors Vitali, Shakur, La Rochelle, and Craven. Um, and they are caring for all of them. Um, so just three or four states that have no UVI specialists or very few within state boundaries, which represents a large uh, number of people who have no easy access to UVI care. So in conclusion, we found a significant travel burden to the nearest UVI specialist for a large proportion of Americans, just under 37%. Uh, this is much greater than what was previously reported for comprehensive ophthalmology or glaucoma. We found that people outside of service area coverage were more likely to belong or more likely to live under the poverty line, be un uninsured or belong to a dependent age group, all of which may further independently impact their ability to access care. Uh, we also found a relative saturation of UVI to specialists in metropolitan areas, and all this together, uh, we believe, highlights the importance of increasing the number of fellowship-trained UVI to specialists in areas, especially that fall outside of existing service area coverage. Uh, and practically for providers, uh, I believe it's important to assess how travel time might impact patients and their ability to access care, and in the future, uh, attempting to quantify the effect that travel time can have on patient compliance and outcomes, specifically in uveitis and ophthalmology in general. Uh, thank you all for listening and for uh, taking the time. And I'd like to acknowledge my research mentors at the Wilmer Eye Institute, specifically Dr. Meg Birkenstock, for helping me with this project. And I'll take any questions. Jane. Thanks. Um, that was great. So just a quick question. How do you determine an hour, I guess, of travel time? Because an hour traveling in New York City, I think, can look a lot different than an hour in Montana. Yeah. So um, great question. Um, there's uh, so ArcGIS, it has a function within it uh, called it's called Esri. And it's linked to an atlas of the United States with all of the road systems in the United States. And it algorithmically calculates how long travel time is going to be dependent on traffic and other conditions in specific locations. Um, so that kind of standardizes. So you can see as you move out west, like you can't see it on a zoomed out view necessarily. But when you zoom in an hour in New York would be exactly as you said, much smaller. It might be like Queens to Manhattan versus if you go to Montana. Um, it could be, you know, I don't know, very far in Montana. <laughs> uh, I don't know towns in Montana. So, um, yeah, so that is how it's standardized using the software. And the reason we use 60 minutes specifically is because I forget the exact government agency, but there's a published metric that says that 60 minutes represents, uh, if you fall outside of 60 minutes, that represents low access to care based on travel time. Um, so that's why we use that as our dividing metric. Yeah, thanks. Yep. People come down from Montana, you know, drive eight, 10, 12 hours and think nothing of it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I was in uh, Dr. Vitali's clinic uh, this Monday, and uh, there was a patient from, I want to say Idaho, who said she had driven seven hours for her appointment, and she was very nonchalant. Yeah, I'm driving back right after this. Um, so we tried to get her out of there as fast as we could, but. <laughs> Any other questions? Great job, yeah, Krishna. Great job to all of our medical students. Um, I think Dr. Kirsten or Dr. Olson is going to introduce the last speaker. Is that correct? I am. Awesome. I am. Thank you, everybody. I am. So uh, everybody, uh, I'm going to keep it brief because you don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from Dr. Kim. It's an honor to have Dr. Kim here. And there's just four things I want to say. Uh, you got to her CV, so I don't need to reiterate any of that. Uh, number one, I can tell you that peers and colleagues say that she's an absolutely outstanding oculoplastic surgeon. 
His number two is that she has special interest in pediatric oculoplastics. And uh, number three is that I could tell you that uh, she's also highly regarded for outstanding teaching skills and uh, very much appreciated for that, which we'll get a chance to experience here in just a second. And number four, everyone who knows her says she's just a wonderful person. So what else can I say other than welcome, Dr. Kim. We're ready for your lecture. All right, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be here and grateful for this opportunity to present to you all this morning. And I'm especially thrilled to present on this topic of new innovations in oculoplastic surgery because while I've only been in practice for about 11 years, I think by far for me, this is the most exciting time in oculoplastics for two main reasons, two treatment options that are relatively new that have surfaced in the last few years that have gone mainstream. So in the medical arena, I believe tepertumumab is one of the most exciting drugs that I've seen for our thyroid eye disease patients. And the surgical arena, corneal neurotization for our neurotrophic keratitis patients. And I'll discuss both today. So tepertumumab, the most successful drug launch, ophthalmic drug launch in history, and for a good reason. It is a revolutionary treatment option for thyroid eye disease. It has transformed practice patterns for thyroid eye disease. And not only that, it has really restructured our understanding of thyroid eye disease and forced us to question kind of our traditional beliefs and allowed us to gain a deeper understanding of disease process. That does not work. Shift things just a little bit. So just some background information. Uh, thyroid eye disease is a progressive autoimmune eye disease. Incidence is about 19 per 100,000 per year. Most patients with thyroid eye disease have hyperthyroidism, remainder are either euthyroid or hypo. And to look at it from a different perspective, about 20 to 50% of patients with hyperthyroidism develop eye disease. And clinical findings stem from orbital inflammation and subsequent tissue swelling. As far as risk factors, we know it is much more common in women, but much more severe in men. And smoking worsens it in every regard, increases the risk of developing the disease, increases the severity, as well as prolonging the duration of it. With each decade, the severity increases as well. And radioactive iodine can increase the risk of developing, of developing or worsening the existing disease. As far as soft risk factors, selenium and vitamin D deficiency can contribute as well as stress. And you're all familiar with the clinical findings of the eyelids, eyelid retraction, certainly one of the most characteristic findings in our thyroid eye disease patients that affects about 90% of them. And in the acute phase, they can also have eyelid edema and erythema. Ocular surface changes include conjunctival injection, chemosis, caruncular edema, as well as exposure keratopathy that can stem from about 60% of patients that end up with uh, proptosis and lag ophthalmos. And lastly, about half the patients are affected by diplopia from restrictive strabismus. And about 5% of patients end up with compressive optic neuropathy that can impact their vision. And the pathogenesis of thyroid eye disease is complex. We don't fully understand it, but we know there is an overexpression and activation of insulin-like growth factor one receptors in orbital fibroblasts and B cells and T cells. And with this activation and interaction with thyrotropin receptors, we see an increase in cytokine production and hyaluronic accumulation that increases uh, edema and inflammation in the orbital adipose tissue, as well as muscles. And so with all of this, uh, the way I've always traditionally thought about thyroid eye disease and how I teach thyroid eye disease to my residents is to think of thyroid eye disease in terms of disease activity and disease severity. Just because they look severe doesn't necessarily mean that they're acutely active and vice versa. So in order to determine the disease activity, there's lots of versions of the clinical activity score. This is kind of fading out as well, but this is the simplest one that I like to teach my residents because it really focuses on just the basic signs of inflammation that we see in pretty much all inflammatory conditions, which is pain, redness, and swelling. And on the initial visit, we concentrate on the external findings. On subsequent visits, more of the orbital findings that can impact vision, proptosis, and motility and four or greater positive components indicate active phase of the disease. 
And of course, neuroimaging will show oftentimes hypertrophy of the muscles. And I'm sure the residents are all familiar with the mnemonic for I am slow, I think is the common one that indicates that inferior rectus is most commonly involved and lateral rectus is the least commonly involved uh, muscle for uh, thyroid eye disease. You can also see fat hypertrophy, lacrimal gland enlargement. And of course, anytime we're uh, obtaining neuroimaging, we're especially interested in seeing whether there's apical crowding or optic nerve compression. And based on this information, we can determine disease activity. The acute phase or active phase lasts about one to three years where the orbital signs are progressively worsening or the chronic phase where the inflammation has pretty much subsided or quieted down, but you see kind of resulting permanent damage from it. And the disease severity, it just basically stratifies the findings that I've pointed out to mild, moderate, severe, and then a small subset of patients that have sight-threatening disease as well. And once we have both of that information, then we determine kind of the treatment algorithm. What do we do if they're in the ac acute phase? Well, the first goal is to kind of put out the fire because they are inflamed. And then the goal is to reduce the damage by controlling the inflammation. We know it's relatively self-limiting disease. So sometimes if it's mild, we wait it out. And if needed, preserve vision. And really the traditionally, the only recommended surgery in the active phase used to be orbital decompression. And if you deem that they're in the chronic phase, then you assume, well, the fire has been put out, now it's time to restore. It's more performing the elective surgeries such as your business surgery and eyelid surgery. And the traditional belief was that we had, you know, not great options for controlling inflammation. And certainly we didn't think that we could alter the course of the disease. And a lot of medications have been tried that targeted different aspects of the inflammatory cascade. And really, I didn't really see them work that well for our thyroid patients, which is why I think we are still hugely dependent on prednisone with all of its side effects. Until tepertumumab surfaced, this is a fully human monoclonal antibody inhibitor of IGF-1R, which then turns off downstream signaling, thereby reducing inflammation. It is an infusion though. It is an infusion every three weeks for a total of eight infusions. So it's about a six month commitment for the patients. And at the height of the pandemic in 2020, this original article came out that looked at tepertumumab in patients with active thyroid eye disease. And we were seeing results that we had never seen before with any medical management for thyroid eye disease we were seeing about close to 80% overall response to the therapy, as well as about 60% of patients that achieved a clinical activity score of zero to one from four or greater. And as you can see in the photo, it certainly looked as though uh, we were uh, able to possibly alter the course of the disease because again, we were not, we had never seen results like this before with any other medical management. And so the modified belief came that maybe we do now have an effective option for controlling inflammation, and maybe we can in some patients alter the disease course. Another belief originally was that surgery really is the best option for improving proptosis, maybe preserving vision for patients with uh, compressed optic neuropathy, and for minimizing severe diplopia, as well as uh, eliminating eyelid retraction. And so for whether it's for proptosis, compressive optic neuropathy, stretch optic neuropathy, orbital decompression was the answer. But again, going back to the, the study results showing that 80% of over 80% of patients responded to tepertumumab in terms of proptosis. And we were seeing greater than three millimeters of improvement from tepertumumab as seen in the photo. Again, numbers that we only saw previously with surgical intervention. And as far as diplopia, if it's mild, we were able to maybe treat them with prisms. It's still controversial. I think it's very institutional dependent whether we liked radiotherapy for this or not. But certainly if severe, a lot of them require strabismus surgery. But studies showed with tepertumumab, about 70% of patients saw improvement in diplopia and neuroimaging that confirmed actually reduction in size of the muscles that were involved. And lastly, eyelid retraction, certainly surgical correction of these patients. Once again, when the fire was put out, they're quiet, they're stable. We perform surgery to achieve results like this. This is a patient of mine that uh, before treatment looked like this. After treatment, she surprisingly didn't have that great of a response to proptosis, 
But as you can see, retraction greatly improved and she was happy. She did not want anything else after this. So now, potentially a medical management that can achieve all of these findings that traditionally only surgery could achieve. But this is not a perfect drug. This is not what I'm saying. I always approach everything with a healthy dose of skepticism and nor is it a permanent fix either. The original study showed about 30% flare within two years of cessation of medication. And so there's a follow-up study that was published in 2020 called the Optic X study. And with this study, they looked at three groups. One was um, a longer duration of active disease group. The original study, the patients only had thyroid eye disease for about six months. This study looked at those with uh, 12 months. And those patients that didn't respond to the first round of treatment, and then patients that had a flare up. As far as the longer duration group, pretty much the same outcome as the, the shorter duration group, excellent results in every regard. Those that didn't respond to the first round of uh, medication, as expectedly, they didn't respond to another round either. And those with flare, actually, they responded very well to another round of tepertumumab. But again, this is not a cheap drug, and it's certainly not an easy one to get insurance approval from. It has added a lot of administrative burden on our staff and myself. Um, it's $400,000 per infusion. So you can see why they, there's a lot of resistance to approving this drug. So we have to, correct, for the entire treatment course, yeah. So uh, we have to also take that into account as well. And last traditional belief that I think this medication is now starting to more and more debunk is that inflammation only exists in the active phase. That was kind of our traditional thinking. And medical management certainly was ineffective in the chronic phase. We didn't really even try it. That was time to do surgery. Two months ago, Horizon, the company that produced uh, tepertumumab, came out with a phase four clinical trial in patients with chronic thyroid eye disease, two to 10 years with very low or zero clinical activity score. So basically people that we would never really treat with um, medical treatment in the past. And this study showed greater than 60% improvement in proptosis and greater than two millimeters of improvement in proptosis, which was a very big surprise. So maybe we can treat these patients in the chronic phase as well and still anticipate improvement. But another thing to consider, of course, like any other medication, it has side effects. And so you have to take that into account for somebody with very mild disease, do you wanna potentially risk hearing loss, which is the biggest side effect that patients always worry about, but common ones like muscle cramps, alopecia, they do get better after cessation of the drug but something to also consider when considering maybe even the repeat treatments. And so this is certainly a drug that physicians are excited about, but not only that, it's also a drug that patients are incredibly excited about. And it's the, it's the first I've seen that actually. And I think it's because it's spoken to their quality of life. And I'm sure you guys have seen this commercial. This is Jeannie. Most of my patients know Jeannie, refer to her by name as if it's her friend. And it's because I think they, this company did a wonderful job of marketing this drug, of really kind of honing it down to what really bothers patients about this condition, which is the terrible proptosis that they, they see as a deformity. And so she's kind of gained, a genie has kind of gained a reputation that's close to flow for progressive. Everybody kind of knows her in the thyroid community. And as you can see, quality of life huge difference between the placebo group and those treated with tepertumumab. And especially the orange line indicates change in appearance that has led to increased quality of life. As you can see, a big difference for this group that's received tepertumumab. And we forget how this impacts them on a day-to-day -day basis. As you can see, studies have shown that, you know, patients with thyroid eye disease, they have worse quality of life than those with heart failure, pulmonary emphysema, diabetes. I mean, that's really hard to believe, but you could understand why, because it's such a visible condition. Oops. So I'll tell you, this is one of my patients. Um, this is a patient that came right before tepertumumab came out. I'd been seeing her for a while. 
She had seen, you know, two to three other surgeons beforehand. She also has a, a clotting disease that prevented her from getting any surgery because she couldn't come off for anticoagulants. And she cried at every visit. And clinically, she's not that bad. She has some retraction, some proptosis, but she was miserable and so unhappy with how her appearance has changed. She brought me a stack of her photos from how she used to look. And this is, and she was reasonable. It's not like she wanted to look like how she did 21 years ago, but she just wanted me to know the changes that she had undergone. She was on the brink of divorce, so literally cried at every visit. And March of that year that I was seeing her, this is when Tepertumab was FDA approved. She completed it, and this is how she looked afterwards without any surgery. Still to this day, she is my happiest patient because it has improved her quality of life so much. So how has Tepertumab impacted my practice? It's kind of transforming how I think of the disease. It's certainly shifted my management from surgical to medical, about 30 to 40% reduction in surgery, actually. And for the first time, I can offer a non-surgical option for improving their appearance. So just like that previous patient who thought, you know, I can't have surgery, I'm never going to be normal again, this drug has finally actually given them that potential, which is why I think it's one of the most amazing drug launches in history. And now shifting gears is something that's just been as impactful in the surgical arena is corneal neurotization. You don't need to hear about the cornea from an oculoplastics person, so I'll keep it brief. This is a degenerative condition, neurotrophic keratopathy, characterized by decrease or loss of corneal sensation where the trigeminal nerve is involved. Incidence is about 50 to 100,000. And pathophysiology of neurotrophic keratitis is that uh, the corneal surface is prone to injury, Decrease, there's decreased reflex hearing, decreased epithelial healing uh, that results in persistent epithelial defects, corneal ulcers, and possibly perforations. Three stages of treatment. Stage one, oculoplastics usually is not involved because they're mainly lubricating. Stage two is when usually get our, our calls from our corneal colleagues asking for usually a temporary tarsorophy, maybe a gold weight or an eyelid spacer graft if there's facial nerve paralysis, especially associated with it. Stage three is when they're now asking for that permanent tarsorophy because nothing is working and they're worried about continuous perforation. And there is a, a medical option that also recently surfaced, but uh, I don't know about your experience here, but it just has not worked well for us. It's an incredibly expensive drug. Again, it's, I think, about $10,000. And we're not seeing the 65% resolution that the, the studies have shown. Now, studies have shown that maybe decreasing the frequency to four times a day, they've seen better, better improvement with that. So maybe it's a compliance issue, I'm not sure. But we just weren't impressed with, the, with Oxerbate. So then came corneal neurotization. And there's a lot being published right now in the literature about corneal neurotization, surgical technique, the graft materials, duration to sensei cornea, and the success rate. So I'll go over a little bit of it. So the direct method for uh, corneal neurotization actually surfaced in 2009. And I'll tell you, I was not aware of this. Bob, were you aware of this in 2009? Yeah. And the direct method is basically dissecting out the superorbital, supertrochlear um, nerve that's intact and directly laying that around the anesthetic cornea on the limbus. I think 2015 is when the indirect method came out. And this is when I think more and more people became aware of the surgical technique. And the indirect method is just placing a nerve graft, at the time it was a serial nerve graft, from the intact superorbital to, and or the supertrochlear and laying the serial nerve around the limbus of the anesthetic cornea. And now there's just so many different variations of this. There's an endoscopic method, a minimal incision method. So there's a lot of that. And as far as grafts, uh, the initial autograph that was used was a serial nerve graft. Now, some people are using greater auricular nerve, which is just as effective. And now there's a cadaveric option as well that has shown uh, great promise. And it gets really nuanced in terms of the technique. Uh, how do you attach the serial nerve to the intact superorbital supertrochlear? Do you, do you do it end to end, end to side? So methods of coaptation are even being discussed and argued. And if you're interested in knowing all about this, this is actually a fantastic review. I'm not going to go through each one, of course, but it was done by the Mass Eye and Ear Group. And so it goes over all the advantages and disadvantages of the different techniques if you're interested in learning more about it. 
So at Emory, we do a team-based approach. We've pretty much done the indirect method the entire time. And um, I do adults as well as peds, so I've done both. And the cornea uh, folks do the actual laying down the nerve around the, the, the cornea itself, and the plastic surgeons harvest a serial nerve for us. So this is the plastic surgery team harvesting the serial nerve. Um, posterior to the lateral malleolus is where the incision is made. And they uh, obtain about a 15 centimeter um, length of the graft. And then I'm doing this portion where I either make a sub-brow incision bilaterally or a lit crease incision. And then isolate either superorbital or supertrochlear. I traditionally like superorbital because the caliber of the nerve is a better match for the large serial nerve. And the serial nerve is tunneled across the nasal bridge with a hemostat. And then I, it's, I apologize, this is not the best photo, but that's an in to side coaptation of the serial nerve to the superorbital. On the anesthetic side, I use a right needle to pass the serial nerve to the superior fornix. And the incisions are closed. And this is when the cornea specialist takes over. And I'll speed through some of this. This is probably the most tedious portion of the surgery where we have to open up the perineurium, I mean, epineurium, I'm sorry, and then divide out all the fascicles. So I'll fast forward through some of this. So the epineurium is being opened and the individual fascicles are teased out. We can usually get, get about six fascicles. So I'm trying to fast forward here. And once that's done, then sometimes he uses a gas hook or just forceps and each fascicle is passed around the limbus. Okay. And again, we're seeing results that were completely unexpected. This patient, multiple failed corneal transplants had pretty much a permanent tarsorophy in place, went from light perception. After a few months after a successful corneal neurization and the scar started uh, improving, went to hand motion. Once she achieved a sensei cornea, was able to get a corneal transplant and refracted to 2020. So at this point, it's the cornea service that follows these patients. So I thought my work was done. I'm feeling pretty good. And <laughs> it's an amazing surgery. Thought I was done. But apparently when you do enough of these and patients do really well, they find their way back to you for additional services or other services, actually other specialties. And so I'll go over a few cases where um, we've done some interesting things for these patients after a successful neurotization. So back to this patient that had 20-20 vision after her successful corneal transplant. She still can't see, that was her complaint. Well, obviously because she has terrible ptosis from everything that those eyes have endured. And so I realized, oh, ptosis is already the, the bane of an, every oculoplastic surgeon, <laughs> but um, it's a love-hate relationship for sure. But having a serial nerve graft there certainly didn't make things easier. So it's amazing how the serial nerve, I thought I placed it really high in the superior fornix, somehow migrated much more inferior than where I thought it was. So I found it much lower than where I expected it. So the location of the nerve graft was a surprise. Dissection is of course a little tougher because there's more scarring. And I've uh, learned that the eyelid contour is a little bit more challenging to achieve the ideal contour because where the graft is, there's always a little bit of ptosis. And I've traditionally only done anterior approaches for these patients. I would, I'm curious to see if anyone would be brave enough to try a posterior approach. And if you're not the one doing the surgery, you certainly want to warn whoever is going to be doing it that there is a graph there. I received a phone call from um, a colleague that practices kind of out in the middle of nowhere, Georgia. So if you're familiar with Georgia, there's Atlanta and then there's the rest of Georgia. And he was unaware of this procedure did not know the patient underwent this procedure, patient failed to mention it to him. I got a call saying, this patient needs a biopsy. I found this lesion I've never seen before during my ptosis repair. I'm sending her to you right away. And I said, thank you so much for not cutting it. We know exactly what that is, but yes, please send the patient back to me. So warn the surgeon that this graft is there. So this is her one month post-op, as you can see, Right side still has a little bit more swelling than the left and immediately I couldn't raise it as high as I wanted to, so I just, I just matched the other side to that contour. 
So second case, this is a 41-year-old female, sphenoid wing meningioma resection involving the right cavernous sinus that resulted in cranial nerve three, five, and six palsy. Ended up with count finger vision in that eye with kind of the similar story as the previous patient, a recurrent epithelial defects, strom stromal scarring. Ended up with a permanent tarsorophy. She underwent a successful corneal neurotization and her vision improved to 2050. Then what happened? She ended up with debilitating diplopia. Um, and she was sent to our pediatric colleagues. And it turns out the strabismus surgery is a little bit more challenging as well due to where you have to make the incisions. And so this was a publication by our uh, pediatric group. Um, Natalie Weil is no longer with us. She joined uh, Louisiana. So we're very sad about that. But before she left, she was part of this group. And basically their pearls for the pediatric uh, specialist was try to make a paralimbal incision as small as possible with relaxing incisions to avoid tearing of the conjunctiva because the conjunctiva is very fragile and friable. Avoid, if you can, uh, the supranasal quadrant and superior rectus muscle altogether because of the, the placement of the nerve graft and be prepared with an amniotic membrane graft in case you can't primarily close the conjunctiva. So last case, 31-year-old female, underwent a craniotomy for a cyst. We had no records, um, but she resulted in a cranial nerve 5 and 7 palsy. Vision was 2150. She also had a gold weight placed by an outside surgeon due to the facial nerve palsy. And this is what bothered her the most. And this was her motivation for getting the neurotization surgery in hopes that maybe she could have the gold weight removed underwent a successful neurotization, went from 2150 to 2060, but she still had the exposure issue from her facial nerve palsy. So we actually sent her to our scleral lens specialist who struggled because of this large nerve around the limbus. And we learned now to actually try to leave about a two millimeter uh, margin between the limbus and the nerve graft in the event that patients need uh, something like a scleral lens. And this patient did get a successful scleral lens fitting, corrects to 2020, now planning on the gold weight removal, which has made her so happy because she never thought that was actually possible beforehand. And so again, another patient that thought, that thought she wouldn't ever be normal again, we we're able to get her close. And hence, I think the two most exciting things um, in oculoplastics currently. Thank you. Yes. That was an outstanding presentation, uh, June. Thank you. <clears throat> Make a quick comment about Tepetumumab. Yeah. Um, first of all, Ray Douglas is driving a really nice car now. <laughs> I bet he is. But uh, it, it's interesting, the history on that, you know, that was initially developed as an anti-cancer drug. Right. Didn't really work for that but they found a little piece in the literature that said, oh, it also may decrease fibrosis and inflammation and put a lot of money into it, getting a lot of money back out of it. Mm -hmm. But we, the other side effect, I know you couldn't go over everything, is inflammatory bowel disease, but just to underline how happy these patients are. I had a patient who developed de novo ulcerative colitis while on it, mm. and she did not want to stop. Yeah. Uh, she said, yep. I don't care, you know, I, I want to finish this. So it's, it's really remarkable. The other thing I make a real quick comment on, and I have to always do this when we talk about thyroid eye disease, we all talk about Rundle's curve. And I would say that it, it, it's real, but it's a minority of patients. The, the large majority of patients, in my experience, present without any inflammation at all. We interestingly had a five-year-old non-smoker last week who presented with lid retraction, von Grafe's sign, a little bit of proptosis, no inflammation whatsoever. So we right. don't understand what's going on with this disease. Yeah. If you look at insulin-like growth factor one titers, they're usually not elevated in these patients as opposed to thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, which, which usually is. And in fact, the higher, the, the ones who do have it, the higher their titer, the less inflammation they have. So we don't know for sure what's going on, but that drug works great. And that was an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I see a, a lot of pediatric thyroid eye disease, and I would say only about maybe 5% of them present with inflammation. And the younger they are, the less inflammation they have. And the only change that I see as I follow them is that their proptosis worsens and that's it. And it, and it gets better. 
as their thyroid levels improve. And so why children are able to temper the inflammation that adults can't? Yeah, there's so much we still don't know about thyroid eye disease, but I think temper two map is forcing us to actually think about it a little bit more, which is also nice. Yes, I think. Mm -hmm. And right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So the the uh, studies with the initial studies with tepertumumab um, specifically excluded patients with optic neuropathy. Correct. So um, have you had any experience with? Sort of, I guess it would be somewhat off-label use of tepertumumab for the acute phase with optic neuropathy, how quickly it works. Is it fast enough to avoid decompression and steroids? So it's interesting you mentioned that there's actually a study that going on right now looking at that. And it's not so much does the drug work fast enough, it's can we get approval fast enough for the drug to get them started? No, and practically speaking, that's been our barrier. Um, to try this more quickly in patients with, uh, with optic nerve involvement. But yes, I have seen it. I have a handful of patients that I've, I've tried it because uh, I've also learned that you can get two doses right away without approval for urgent use. And so you're able to at least get them two doses um, but you know, if it's going to take a while, I still resort to decompression to make sure that their vision is preserved. But we are seeing promising results, and I believe this study will probably be presented at our fall ASOPERS meeting and subsequently will be published. But I think we're seeing actually very good results in patients with compression as well. So yes. it, it's interesting. I, I think because this is so good in so many ways, financial is going to be the biggest yes. barrier. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, sadly, that's a battle for a lot of new things coming down the pike that the price tags are so high, yet the impact is huge. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we handle that? So it just seems amazing to me that you can just pull a nerve down out of the leg, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and you just kind of you just kind of hook it to the opposite side. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know that there's no axonal connection at right. that point. Right. And you just kind of slap it around the limbus of the cornea. I mean. I just, I mean, if you ask me, what are the odds of success? If you came to me as a yeah. corneal specialist 10 years ago, hey, right. we're going to do this and this, I'd say, you're out of your mind. Right. That's not going to work. Exactly. So it shows you how often we've got to think outside of the box and prepare to consider what has always been for corneal specialists, the worst of all diseases. Bad neurotrophic right. keratitis just is horrendous. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You actually don't want any axons in the nerve. And when you get a cadaveric transplant, there's no nerve in there. It's just the neural sheaths. Because when you cut a nerve, it undergoes Wallerian degeneration. It dies all the way back. So, you know, there's, you you're not, don't need the axons. You just need the sheath to direct. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah, and there's a lot of focus of the research right now is how does this actually work? Is it direct sprouting from the nerve that's laid around the limbus? which I think is probably less likely, or is it that it is stimulating the native nerves to regenerate? And that seems more likely, but still, it, it's incredible how it works. Very exciting. Got any other questions? Bob. Yeah. You know, in terms of tep 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 treated patients, doing muscle surgery on them has changed. Yes. And the experience of the terribly swollen, edematous, mm -hmm. tight orbit, um, it's different. The mm -hmm. muscles look normal. Yes. And this, so when we still have to do muscle surgery, the other side benefit is that technically the surgery is a lot more straightforward. Yes. I've been impressed with that. It's, it's a big difference. Yes. So this yes. is, is, this is a game changer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out because that's also why it's shifting our timeline for performing some of these quote unquote traditionally elective surgery where, where we waited and waited and waited until they were quiet and stable. But now we're asking, should we just go ahead and do these surgeries while they're on treatment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Question back here. Do you see any damage? Oh, thank you. Um, in the leg, like, post-operatively, any loss of sensation or function or anything like that? So temporarily, they do have some decreased sensation, but so far we have not had any, any issues with the harvest site. 
And I think one patient developed a little bit of a seroma and that was it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for the talk, Dr. Kim. I had a question along the same lines. Uh, have there been studies harvesting nerves from different locations? Also, uh, you mentioned like six fascicles needed from the, or you, you get six fascicles or so from the uh, sural nerve. Have you ever tried like less or more? Uh, uh, there were studies looking into those differences at all. So um, in terms of different autographs, so greater auricular nerve graft is also being used. And the fascicles, I leave that up to the cornea specialists. And so six is average, but certainly if you have a huge serial nerve, you're going to get like nine to 11 sometimes, or less if you have a much smaller serial nerve. And so um, I think in terms of, if I remember correctly, he mentioned he needs at least four. So, and we have no problems getting that from the serial nerve or the cadaveric. Not that we're aware of, as long as you have complete um, uh, coverage of the limbus, it doesn't seem to impact the overall, because mm -hmm, you cut away the rest anyways. Mm -hmm. Yes. Here. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kim. Um, I was just wondering, are there certain patients for whom the graft would not be an option? Just going into it, you know that you wouldn't be able to do it? Yeah, I mean, there's still a lot to consider. A lot of times these patients are really sick. Um, there's a reason why they're neuro neurotrophic to begin with. Maybe they had a, had a huge tumor, brain tumor that was resected. And so comorbidities and age. And we know that the older they are, the less successful the surgery is. So I recently had an 85-year-old and you know the cornea special and I discussed it for a while. And he's also a very sick patient. So we decided against it. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that's just because the relative regenerative potential of their nerves goes yeah. down as they yeah. age? Yeah. yeah, it just, you know, as we get older, we know <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> it's, I know, it just, you know. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.